Hello, welcome to Conversations with Code Heroes. Uh, I am Magdalena Woolery, and it is my honor to um, bring into the conversation um, Adriano, and he's based in Italy, um, and um, he is a doctor, medical doctor, who trained at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and um, he is retired now, but um, an IPFAN member, and I would like to pass uh, the mic over to him so he can tell you uh, about himself. Adriano, could you give an introduction, please? Yes, my name is Adriano Cattaneo. I am 75 years old uh, and retired. Uh, I'm a medical doctor, but after the first 10 years of clinical work, I decided to move to public health and then I went to the London School, as you say, of tropical medicine, of uh, hygiene and tropical medicine to, grad to graduate in uh, public health and epidemiology or community health, as it was called at that time. And my, the, 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 the rest of my career after that, that year in London was uh, as a public health uh, person and researcher. Uh, and I worked in several countries in addition to Kenya, that, that was my first assignment. A couple of years after I graduated in Italy, uh, I worked in Mozambique. Later on, uh, after I, after the the, the the masters of science degree in London, I went to Mozambique once again. Then I moved to Nicaragua. Then I was asked to join WHO uh, in Geneva at headquarters, and I stayed there for four years for the program for the control of diarrhea diseases and acute respiratory infections in children. And then I was offered the job as a researcher in Italy, uh, an institute for maternal and child health. That you worked in Kenya and um, uh, Mozambique. And um, your, I would love to know your experience there and especially um about the children that you cared for could you tell us about your experience and um yeah. the situation um when i graduated as a medical doctor in in padua italy uh, my my idea was already to go and spend time in some uh, uh, low income country and i uh, got in touch with uh, with uh, an ngo and the NGO offered me a post in, in Kenya, in a small rural hospital in Kenya. Uh, so I, I had to wait, of course, because uh, I wanted to learn a bit more about, you know, obstetric, gynecology, pediatrics, uh, surgery, and have some practice so that I could learn things that could be useful for my assignment to Kenya, where I would work alone as a doctor. Uh, and then I, I went also to London uh, at the St. Pancras Hospital for Tropical Diseases. I wanted to learn a little bit of that. While I was in London, of course, I went to several libraries and bookshops and bought some books that I found very interesting about medical care in so-called developing countries. And I had learned about the, you know, the, the, the things that I would meet, the, the, the situations that I would meet when I, when I, but I, you know, reading things is different than seeing things real. Yeah. And, 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 and the first, the first, uh, the first thing that shocked me when I, when I started to work in Kenya in the outpatient department or in the health centers that were um, uh, sort of uh, coordinated by the rural hospitals where I was working uh, was to see uh, malnourished children coming to the, to the hospital. And some of them in very desperate conditions uh, for a disease called marasmus. And marasmus were, was well described in the book that I had bought, bought in London, but I, I had seen pictures, but I had never seen a real child, a real infant with marasmus. Uh, just, just skin and bones. I mean, yeah. that, that's the description. Okay, I was going to ask for any viewers that did not know what that was, if you could yeah. explain. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when an NGO wants to uh, get some money from donors in, in Europe, usually they show pictures of children with marasmus because that is shocking for, you know, for viewers, for readers, and usually it, it leads to donation of some money. Uh, yeah. the, the, usually it, it, it starts uh, in the first six months of life, 
uh, the, the infant, the, the baby is, 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 is deeply malnourished. Uh, it is described as skin and bones because there is no flesh left. I mean, no, no muscle, nothing left. The the the, the tube, is, is, everything is 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 completely lost, yeah. and it it is due it is due to the lack of breast milk. I mean, the, the cause of manasmus is uh, feeding formula instead of breast milk. Yeah. Uh, and why, why do mothers in such remote areas of Kenya decided to stop breastfeeding and replace it with formula? Well, first of all, because formula was available everywhere. I, I, I immediately found out that in every shop in the villages where I was working, there was formula displayed you know, on shelves that could be bought. Uh, usually Nestlé, Nestlé was the, the, the most um, common brand being sold. And there was also marketing. I mean, formula was presented by you know, simple ads in the shops or even billboards on roads as, as the, the good nutrition for babies. And so many mothers were talked into buying formula instead of giving breast meat to their babies. And um, for those who were wealthy enough to, uh, to afford the, the, the right amount of formula, that was a problem, but not such a big problem as the for those who had very low income, because with the low income, it was uh, very expensive to buy the formula. And the only way to save money was to put a little bit of power and, and quite a lot of water. And so to over dilute the formula and the over dilution leads to uh, a very small amount of calories and, and fats and proteins and carbohydrates given to the baby. And it's very slowly, but in a matter of weeks, this leads to, to marasmus. And marasmus was a, I would say, a very difficult disease to treat. 80 to 9 percent of the babies with marasmus that reached the hospital via centers wouldn't survive. Very few survived, and uh, and that was a disaster and a tragedy. And that struck me, I mean, in the profound of my heart, and I was so, you know, angry with the causes, uh, with, 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 with marketing of, of, of breast milk substitutes that led those women, those mothers to, uh, to stop breastfeeding that I, I mean, I, I immediately decided that the rest of my life I would fight against that. That was my first decision. What year was that uh, when you were in um, Kenya? I, gra I, gra I graduated in Italy in July of 1972. Yeah. And, I landed, and I landed in Nairobi in February of 1974. Oh, okay, in Kenya. Um, and so that experience, where you took those, that anger and that horrific experience of seeing the suffering from the unethical marketing. Um, and where did you take that? What um, you carried on the fight, but uh, where did you go after that? And how did you fight? Yes, uh, well, the first thing that I did, uh, and that was uh, when I was uh, in, in that sort of remote area of Kenya, was to uh, uh, set up a, a program for health education, because I thought, I thought that that would uh, help solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, um, so I, I trained some of the uh, assistants, uh, nurses, and uh, orderlies that were working in the hospital, in the health centers, about good nutrition and breastfeeding and why breastfeeding should not be stopped for, for being replaced with formula. And there were, you know, the, this, uh, in, in the local language, these ladies were uh, repeating the same message all the time and everywhere. I mean, in the hospital, in the health centers, in the health posters. We had a mobile clinic as well. So uh, I don't know if it was effective. I didn't have the time to measure the effectiveness of that intervention at the time. But that was our first our first response to the, to the problem. Um, and the, the second response was to inform uh, you know the health authorities that the, the hospital where I was working was a mission hospital. Yeah. Uh, but it was, of course, uh, in coordination, in collaboration with the national system. There was a, a public hospitals in, at about about 50 kilometers away uh, in the district capital. 
And so we were, I, I was talking with the managers of the mission network and the managers of the public health networks uh, in order to try to uh, inform uh, shops that they should at least try not to advertise or to avoid selling those products. Of course, in a, in a free market system, it's impossible to do that. Yeah. And um, I must say that the government was not very, inter the government, I mean, the, the district government, I didn't have access to the national government, but the district government had so many other problems related to so many other things that, that, that this was considered sort, a sort of a minor problem for them and was not addressed. So that, yeah, that, that was the, my attempt at doing things. Ideally, I would not uh, boycott only Nestlé, I would boycott also Danone, because the two of them are, are making quite a lot of damage, quite a lot of harm to the health of women and children around the world. So the boycott should be extended. And I personally apply these principles and I never buy any Nestlé or Danone product, even if it is hidden other different names. And the reason why is because of the harm they do to mothers and children, uh, in, 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 in main, especially in low and middle income countries, where, you know, by, by, uh, by persuading them through, uh, through predatory marketing and through the health system and through digital marketing, Thank you so much.